All right, everybody, welcome back. We are continuing on with Language Power Tutorial 1. Uh, we're going to talk about the function words. So you hopefully already watched the first part of this tutorial, this chapter, where we talked about content words. We are moving on to function words. So we're here on page 14, and I will continue um, taking us through this and talking about some of the ideas that Professor Ferris is talking about in our textbook. So we're talking about defining and identifying function words. So as their name suggests, function words are best identified by how they are used in combination with other words in a sentence. So the following chart summarizes the major function word categories we will discuss in this tutorial. So I'm here in the chart. So function word category and then of course the purpose, right? What do we use them for? Why are they important to the grammar of English sentences? So pronouns. A pronoun replaces a noun or an entire, an entire noun phrase. Now again, we're going to get to noun phrases soon, but hopefully at least this idea of a pronoun replacing a noun makes sense, right? My name is Jeff. When I talk about myself, I say I. Um, when I talk to all of the students in this class, there are many of you with many different names. I just say you, right? All of you. Then we have articles and determiners. An article or determiner is a word in a noun phrase that singles that a noun is coming. Articles and determiners modify nouns. So for now, stick with articles a, uh, the letter a, un, an, and the, the. Those are probably the articles we're most familiar with. We'll talk about what determiners are and how they're similar to articles in this tutorial. Then we have auxiliaries, everybody's favorite part of English verb tenses. So an auxiliary appears in a verb phrase and modifies the verb, right? Think about do, not, like, right? Will, go, have, seen, lots of auxiliaries. Then we have prepositions. A preposition precedes, comes before, precedes a noun phrase to create a prepositional phrase. And conjunctions. A conjunction connects phrases and clauses within a sentence. So pronouns. Let's start with pronouns. And of course, let's look at some examples of this because when you just look at it on the chart, I think it's pretty normal to go, oh my, what is this? What does any of this mean? So let's look at examples. So pronouns can replace a noun or an entire noun phrase. There are different types of pronouns. For example, personal pronouns, like the example I gave earlier, I, me, you, he, she, we, they, that refer to specific people. So the professor looks sleepy today. She looks sleepy today. Then we have possessive pronouns. These are pronouns that we use to talk about who something belongs to. That'd be mine, yours, hers, his, ours, theirs, which refer to something that is owned. So that Toyota is my car. That Toyota is mine, right? Mine is acting, is acting like a noun, like a pronoun here. Then we have relative pronouns, who, which, or that. And again, we could probably spend many weeks just talking about this word, about that in English, because it does a lot of things. So one thing that it does is function like a relative pronoun to refer to another noun within a sentence so that you don't have to repeat the same noun twice. For example, some students want to get good grades. Those students should study hard for tests. Students who want to get good grades should study hard for tests. So who is the relative pronoun here? Pronouns are very useful because they can help provide variety in word choice within sentences and paragraphs, but they can also cause confusion if they are not used correctly. See tutorial six for a discussion of pronouns and lexical variety. Lexical just means vocabulary, words. And see tutorial 20 for pronouns and subject verb agreement. We will get there. Next, we have articles and determiners. Articles and determiners share characteristics with both adjectives and pronouns. So like adjectives, articles and determiners modify nouns, and the forms of some determiners can be similar or even identical to related pronoun forms. So I saw a dog. A uh, is an article. The dog was limping. Article. His dog was limping. 
This is not an article. This is not a, un, or the, but it is a determiner. That dog was limping, right? So as Professor Ferris says here, there are only three articles in English, the definite article the and the indefinite articles a uh, and un. The definite article can signal that a noun is a specific, known, unique, or previously identified thing. An indefinite article signals a non-specific noun that has not been previously identified, a dog versus the dog. Not all nouns require articles. See tutorial 23 if you want to focus more on articles. Now, some languages, for example, Russian and Japanese, do not use articles, and English article rules can be tricky, difficult for writers to master. Mastery of articles is important, though, because these little words can make a big change in meaning. Besides articles, there are other categories of determiners that function similarly to articles and noun phrases. These include possessive determiners, such as his, and demonstrative determinators, such as that. So his dog was limping, that dog was limping. We're going to see more examples of this later on this semester. But for now, it's enough to say, oh, his dog, her dog, their dog, our dog. This is called a possessive determiner, right? Because it is telling us who it belongs to. It determines, decides a very specific information about the noun. Okay, then we have auxiliaries. Auxiliaries modify verbs within verb phrases. The highlighted words in the following three sentences are auxiliary verbs. They are used together with the main verbs to indicate whether the action in the main verb is completed in the present, is in progress, or occurred in the past. So, for example, I have met the mayor before. I am going to the store in a few minutes. I was planning to go to the office today, but my car broke down. The highlighted words in the following three sentences are modal auxiliaries. So remember, if you watched uh, the beginning of part one of this, uh, when I introduced these ideas, I was saying, right, if you hear helping verbs, modal verbs, auxiliary verbs, there are all these different words that, that um, connect to how we use verbs in English. In this book, Professor Ferris calls them all auxiliaries. So if it's a modal, it's an auxiliary. If it's a, a, an auxiliary, it's an auxiliary. If it's a helping verb, it's an auxiliary. So don't worry too much if you call this something different or you've seen this uh, a different word used for this idea. Any helping verb in Professor Ferris's book is called an auxiliary. So the highlighted words in the following three sentences are modal auxiliaries. They express possibility, can, might, may, will, or necessity, should, and must, of the specific action in the underlined verb. So I might go to the party if I have time. You should study harder for the next test. I could go to class, but I'm very tired today. Note the difference between I must study hard for the test tomorrow and I might study hard for the test tomorrow. Modal auxiliaries can convey subtle shades of meaning. That just means it can change the meaning and it feels like a small change, but for a native English speaker, it might feel like a big change, which can be especially important in persuasive writing. And here, uh, Professor Ferris asks, are you expressing your opinion strongly or tentatively weakly? And in research writing, are you confident or unsure about your conclusions, about your argument? And you can see tutorial 24 for more information about effectively using modals and ways to avoid errors with these auxiliaries. Now, prepositions are signal words that begin prepositional phrases. A prepositional phrase is a preposition followed by a noun phrase. I'm going to say that again because it's important. It sounds like an easy idea to understand, but when you start to see longer sentences, this can feel more complicated. So a prepositional phrase is just a preposition followed by a noun phrase. Now, while prepositional phrases usually are not grammatically complicated, they are important as building blocks of complex sentence, uh, complex and sophisticated sentences. So the woman in the green dress, prepositional phrase, is watching you. I was going to lower your grade, but under the circumstances, I'll give you another chance. And I'll be able to work on the paper more during the summer. In the preceding examples, 
the prepositional phrases are highlighted and the prepositions themselves are underlined. You can see that these prepositional phrases serve a range of purposes. Now, in the first example, in the green dress functions like an adjective. It tells you more about the woman. Finally, depending on the specific sentence, some prepositions can be used as verb particles that are part of a phrasal or two-word verbs. Now, consider these examples. Bob walked up the hill and Bob looked up the number. This gets complicated. Now, in these two examples, the same word up functions differently. In the first sentence, up is a true preposition and heads the prepositional phrase up the hill. Bob walked up the hill. In the second sentence, up is a verb particle that is part of the two word phrasal verb look up with the noun phrase the number, the direct object of the phrasal verb. This is an easy test. There is an easy test to tell the difference between words functioning as prepositions and operating as verb particles Particles can be moved to follow the direct object noun phrase, but true prepositions cannot. So you can't say, Bob looked the number up. Oh, you can say, forgive me, Bob looked the number up, right? If it's looked up as a phrasal verb, the particle, the preposition can move after a noun. But you can't say, Bob walked the hill up. And that means like I'm highlighting here, this is a true preposition in this example. So the next time you use a particle this way and someone tells you don't end a sentence with a preposition, which is an old sort of rule about English grammar, you can look that person in the eye and say, I didn't. I ended the sentence with a verb particle. And remember, verb particle connects back up here to this one, right? Bob looked the number up, right? Bob, or think about turn up like music or volume, right? Um, <clears throat> I turned the volume up. I turned the TV down. We can do that, right? And that's because that is actually a particle and not a true preposition. Excuse me while I get some water. Now, we're here on conjunctions. Conjunctions join different parts of a sentence. Now, in the following three examples, the conjunction connects two independent clauses to form one sentence. I got home from work late, so I had to feed the cat right away. I fed the cat immediately after I got home from work. And I fed the cat immediately because I had gotten home from work. Now, conjunctions can also be used to connect phrases within a sentence. In this first example, and connects the two underlined verb phrases. After I got home from work, I fed the cat and changed my clothes. In the second example, and connects two prepositional phrases. Over the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we go. This is a common English um, poem, nursery rhyme sort of uh, song. So over the river, prepositional phrase, through the woods, prepositional phrase, connected by a conjunction. And here, and connects two adverb phrases. The big yellow dog crept. Crept means walk very slow. So the big yellow dog crept slowly and stealthily towards the birds. Now, there are two subtypes of conjunctions, coordinating and subordinating. In English, there are seven coordinating conjunctions. And, but, or, for, nor, yet, so... These words connect two equal or independent elements of a sentence, two independent clauses, as in the first set of examples, or two elements of a phrase, as in the second set. There are numerous subordinating conjunctions, for example, because, after, if, although, while. These words connect two sentences in an unequal way. The subordinating conjunction creates a dependent relationship between the two sentences. So, for example, if after appears in a sentence, something has to have happened before it. So, I fed the cat immediately after I got home from work. I got home from work happens before I fed the cat. Similarly, if there is a because in a sentence, there has to be a consequence, a result, something that happens because of something else. So, I fed the cat immediately because... I'd gotten home from work late. Now here the cause is I got home from work late and the effect is I had to feed the cat immediately. The inclusion 
or using because creates a dependent relationship between these two ideas. Now, the difference between coordinating and subordinating conjunctions and their roles in connecting independent and dependent clauses is significant. It's important for both sentence construction and punctuation. You will learn much more about this in tutorial three, where we will focus on phrases, clauses, and sentence types, and tutorial 17, punctuation issues, as well as tutorial 21 for sentence boundaries. So down here in the sidebar, you probably all already know this, but a useful acronym for remembering the seven coordinating conjunctions is FANBOYS. The most commonly used coordinating conjunctions are AND, BUT, and OR. All right, we're almost at the end of this tutorial because that is it for our function words. So now in this video, we've talked about the different function words. And just to go back, remember, function words that we've talked about are pronouns, articles, auxiliaries, prepositions, conjunctions. So here at the end, I'm just going to review some of the practice activities that you will do um, for a grade or for points in Canvas um, soon. So practice two says, use the following abbreviations to categorize the underlined words in the following sentences. P-R-O for pronouns, D-E-T for determiners, including uh, articles, A-U-X for auxiliaries, PREP, P-E-R-P for prepositions, or C-O-N-J for conjunctions. Try to explain what other information in the sentence helped you label the words grammatical category. So that book is hers, right? Now that book, it's a determiner, and the explanation, that precedes a noun and provides more information about it. It identifies, it tells us about a specific book. So let's do the first one together. He came home yesterday. Right? So you can see my comments already here. I identified it as a pronoun. Right? How do I know this is a pronoun? Well, okay, he is the subject of the sentence, so we know it has to be a noun because it's the subject of the sentence. But we don't have a proper name. It's not like the name Jeff or Rachel or Jenny or something like that. Right? It's uh, a he. Okay, I know that he can be used to take the place of another person or another proper noun. So he is a pronoun, right? It's the subject of a sentence. It's replacing a proper noun. It's a pronoun. How about one more? She is a physical fitness enthusiast. Enthusiast means she's excited about it. She likes it, right? So she is a physical fitness enthusiast. As you can see here, I wrote article. Up here it would be D-E-T for determiner. Okay, how do I know this is a determiner? Well, it's one of the three articles in English, a, uh, un, or the. It comes before a noun phrase. So here's enthusiast looks like the noun, right? And physical fitness, both of these can be different parts of speech depending on the context, but it looks like physical fitness, both are modifying enthusiasts. So they're kind of acting like adjectives. So we have an article that comes before a noun phrase, Okay, this has got to be a determiner, right? So I want you to think about those same things for number three through 10. We won't go through them together, but be prepared to answer those questions for a grade in Canvas soon. Then we have this activity on page 21. Now it says, take a piece of writing that you're working on now or completed, finished recently. Analyze a good sized paragraph by labeling each word as a part of speech discussed in this tutorial, noun, verb, adjective, adverb, pronoun, article, or other determiner, auxiliary, preposition, or conjunction. If there are words you're unsure how to label, just mark them with a question mark. Then once you're finished with the labeling, look at the paragraph as a whole and write a paragraph in response to the following questions. So what do you notice about your choices? For example, do you use many prepositions or conjunctions? Are you more likely to choose nouns or pronouns? Right? Do you tend to use more adjectives or adverbs? There are not right answers or wrong answers to this, everybody. Um, the point is just to become aware, start to see, start to notice the things that you do when you're writing so that you can start to make choices about what you want to do and how you want to write in the future. So, to wrap up what we've learned in this tutorial. So we've learned to identify grammatical categories in context. 
Hopefully you feel better about defining and identifying content words, defining and identifying function words, and you understand that knowledge of grammatical categories can help you analyze and avoid errors in your own writing. Next step, so here's what's coming up. You see tutorial two, we're not going there right now, not in this video. But the next steps to build on what you've learned is we're going to learn about how individual parts of speech are built into phrases, clauses, and sentences. That's tutorial three. If you want more help with word form errors, you can see tutorial 14. If you want to learn more about verb tenses, which we will do together, is to look at tutorial 19. If you want to understand and avoid errors in subject verb agreement, you can work through tutorial 20. I hope that we can get to this this semester. If not, Please look at tutorial 20 on your own time, right? You bought this book, keep it, use it, review some of the other chapters that we do not get to this semester. For help with plurals, you can see tutorial 22. For more information about avoiding article errors, see tutorial 23. To learn more about constructing verb phrases, you can see tutorial 24. I think we're going to have to talk about that this semester. And to see more about prepositions, you can see tutorial 25. So hopefully um, going through this video with me, reading this together helped you understand the idea of content and function words, why it is important to identify uh, parts of speech in the context of their sentences, and you have a better understanding of how the different parts of speech come together um, to create meaningful sentences in English. So um, thank you for watching this. Um, definitely check Canvas for any connected quizzes or activities about the ideas. And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you, everybody.